If you want to turn with me, we're going to be in the book of Romans again together. We're going to be looking at the same passage that we looked at together last week. So we're going to be Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 3. And this is what it says. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourselves more highly than he ought to, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned them. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them. If prophecy, in proportion to our faith, prophesy. If service, in our serving. The one who teaches, in his teaching. The one who exhorts, in his exhortation. The one who contributes, in generosity. The one who leads, with zeal. And the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. So we're in week two of our latest sermon series called Gifted. We're looking at what the Bible says about spiritual gifts over the next three weeks together. We're looking at what they are. We're looking at what their functions are. We're looking at, hopefully, how we discover what our, in particular, spiritual gifts are. And then we're going to be looking at how we can put what God has given us into practice how we use them. Last week, if you remember, we opened up this idea of spiritual gifts and we said that spiritual gifts are the abilities that God gives us and gives to believers for the building up of his church. Some of those gifts are supernatural. Some of those gifts are natural abilities that God has given us which are enhanced by the Holy Spirit in order to produce his will and his ways in the church and in our lives. All of them function together, however, to strengthen believers and to point people to Jesus and to see his kingdom advance. God's gifts are for God's people and they are for God's service, for God's success. And as we set up this subject together last week, as we opened up, we spoke about the fact that every single person is gifted. You may not realize it when you look at your life. You may have quite a lowly opinion of yourself. You might see the baggage that you carry around and think to yourself, well, I am not gifted. That might be true for everyone else. That might be true for every other single person on the planet, but not for me. Because you don't know who I am and you don't know what I am like. But that's not what the Bible says. However you feel and think about yourself, you are gifted. If you are a Christian here today, God has gifted you you. And here's the amazing thing about it. You have a role and a purpose to play here in the body of Christ, his church. And when we're talking about spiritual gifts, someone once said that spiritual gifts are tools to build with. They're not toys to play with, and they're not weapons to fight with. That's why we opened up with this passage last week when we were talking about it, and we focused in particular on Paul's teaching about humility, this exhortation to be people who are humble, that we're not to think of ourselves more highly than we ought, but we're called to recognize by the grace of God we are gifted, and then we are called to action. Because your gifting The way God has made you and he has purposed you is vital for what he wants to do here at Hope. And with that in mind, we're revisiting the same passage that we spoke about last week. And this morning, I want to go into a little bit more depth and a little bit more detail, specifically about the type of gifts that God gives. And as we open up this passage again, I want to start with another disclaimer We learned last week that spiritual gifts are given by the grace of God. That means they're not given on merit. If we were given what we deserve, we would get absolutely nothing. And that is such an important truth to grasp. Because unless we grasp that notion, it's easy for us to chase after the gifts rather than chase after the gift giver. Augustine put it like this. It's easy to want things 
from the Lord, but not want the Lord himself. Above all, you and I were created for a relationship with God. That is our very purpose and our very reason for existing. If you want to know the meaning of life, it's this. You were created for a relationship with the Creator. And actually, above everything else, if that is not in place, nothing else matters. And when we chase after the gifts, the presence that God gives, rather than chasing after a relationship with Him, we become puffed up in our thinking. We might look at ourselves and think of ourselves more highly than we ought. Or we'll look at other people and we see that the way God has gifted them. And as a result of that, we look at it and go, do you know what? I am worth nothing. But as we think about this subject today, and more specifically about our own spiritual gifts, I want to look more in depth about the type of gifts which are given. It's fair to say, when we talk about spiritual gifts, you don't simply have one spiritual gift. You may have a dominant spiritual gift in your life, a gift that you are predominantly called to use above others, but you have a number of gifts that God has given you which make you unique to you. I'd call it a gift mix. Think of it maybe in terms of like a bunch of grapes. You know, you get a bunch of grapes, and you'll have grapes on that that vine which are different sizes some which are really big some which are really small but they all have nutrients and they're all designed to do the same thing to build up the body and that is what it is when it comes to your individual gift mix you may have gifts in your life that God is calling you to use above everything else but you have other gifts as well that God has blessed you with that he calls you to use as well and we see this on a number of occasions in the bible that Christians are called to use a number of gifts. And as we revisit this passage today, what we see about spiritual gifts as well is that there are some gifts that certain people are gifted with, but some of these gifts are also character traits that all of us should show examples in at some point in our life in some ways. So Romans chapter 12, verses 7 to 8 says this, If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If your gift is to encourage, then give encouragement. If your gift is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Notice that within this passage, there are some specific gifts given, which maybe only a few people really show the character traits of, But there are also things within this particular passage that whether you are primarily gifted in those things or not, as a Christian, you are called to show. So it talks about encouragement. It talks about generosity. It talks about showing mercy. Those might not be your specific spiritual gifts, but as a Christian, that's how you're called to live. Today, As we think about spiritual gifts, we'll focus together on this particular passage, but what we need to understand is that this is not an exhaustive list of gifts. There are at least five passages in Scripture which open up this subject on spiritual gifts. In this passage that we're looking at today, we see the gifts which are listed as prophecy, serving, teaching, encouragement, giving, leading, and kindness. But if we were to open up 1 Corinthians 12 together today, we would see the gifts of administration, of discernment, of healing, of interpretation of languages, of prophecy, of wisdom, of apostolic gifts, of helps, of knowledge, of miracles, and of teaching. If we were to open up Ephesians chapter 4 together today, we would see the spiritual gifts of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist listed. If we were to open up 1 Peter chapter 4 together, we would see the gifts of serving and teaching once again listed. And in many respects, we could spend a whole number of weeks looking at these spiritual gifts and going into depth into each and every one, and we would learn greatly by doing so, and we would build ourselves up in knowledge. But the primary focus of this particular sermon series is not necessarily to acquire lots and lots of knowledge but it's to help you understand how you are uniquely made and help you understand how God has gifted you in order that you might use them as a result. These things will be unpacked in life groups a little bit more over the next coming weeks, but I want to encourage you to get into the Word yourself and and look at these subjects yourself as you go along. 
Because when you discover your gifts and what God has done in your life and how God has made you to be uniquely you, what it does is it leads to personal spiritual growth and it leads to a corporate spiritual health. Because once we all find our place, the church becomes what the church is always meant to be. And here are three really simple ways that you can discover your gifts in your life and what God has done in your life and how he has made you, you. Number one, discover what the Bible says about spiritual gifts. Don't just listen to this sermon, don't just go along to your life group, but really open up the scriptures for yourself and see what the scripture says about spiritual gifts. You're not going to know how you're gifted unless you know what the Bible says about spiritual gifts. Number two, You've got to be willing to exercise the gifts that God has given you. It's one thing knowing what they are. It's another thing putting them into practice. But thirdly, we need to continually be active when we know what our spiritual gifts are. You see, spiritual gifts, they're a little bit like a muscle. The more you use them, the more opportunities develop and the the more the Lord opens up opportunities for them to be used. And not only that, When you start operating in one of the spiritual gifts that God has given you, often what happens is other spiritual gifts in your life begin to be highlighted. A good example of that is the man Philip that we read about in Acts chapter 5. When we're first introduced to Philip, what do we see? We see him as a man waiting on tables and serving people. He's feeding people. But because of his faithfulness in being willing to operate in the spiritual gift that God has given him, we turn the page a few chapters and we get to Acts chapter 8 and we see that God opens an opportunity for evangelism for him. So he's walking along a road and he meets an Ethiopian eunuch who's reading the scriptures and he doesn't understand what he's reading. So Philip, he begins to expound the scriptures to him, showing him what they mean and ultimately baptizing him. When we're faithful in the gifts that God has given us and the things that he has entrusted us to do, he'll open up opportunities in our life to do other things as well. And as I said earlier, we're not going to open up every spiritual gift in Scripture, but today I do want to focus on the gifts which are listed here in Romans chapter 12. So in verse 6, Paul starts off by saying, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy according to your faith. What is prophecy? Well, in the Old Testament, when we talk about prophecy, it was a gift given by the Spirit to certain men and women to proclaim the will and the word of God. And when we think about prophecy in those terms, there is a sense that every single Christian is called to operate in this gift in some way, shape, or form. Because once we know God. We can't stay silent about the things that we know. But I want to suggest today that when we think about this gift, if there's something inside of you which just begins to burn and you think to yourself, I want to tell people about Jesus. I want to point people to the way of truth. I want to tell and show people what the word and the will of God is for their life. This might be a bigger part of your life. When we think about the word prophecy. I don't know what comes to mind for you, but I would imagine when we hear that word, we instantly think of the word future, that it might be the ability to predict what is to come. And there is an element of that when we think about prophecy. And we see that in scripture on a number of different times. We could look at the book of Daniel who talks about what is to come. We could look at Revelation and we could see what John says about what is to come there. But the emphasis in the New Testament when we talk about prophecy is about proclaiming God's message with boldness. What's the difference between a teacher and a preacher? A teacher is someone who gives you instructions to follow. A preacher is someone who urges you to follow them with boldness. You therefore serve in the role as prophet every time you proclaim the word of God and you serve in the role of prophet every time you urge someone to follow the right path and to follow God's wills and God's ways. The function of a prophet in the New Testament is always to edify, it's always to exhort, and it's to comfort. That's why we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 3 these words. But the one who prophesies speaks to people for their strengthening, for their encouraging and their comfort. 
prophecy, therefore, is the gift of speaking under the guidance of God's Spirit. It may include prediction, but it always includes proclamation. And then we move on to the gift of service. The word here is the word in Greek, diakonos, and it's used three times in the book of Romans. It's also translated in the book of Luke as preparing a meal for someone. You know, a meal's ministry is a supernatural ministry. You don't realize how important a meal's ministry is until you are hungry. We need people within the body of Christ who can cook food for the glory of God. And when we're talking about the gift of service here in the Bible, we're talking about a gift which is primarily for the church, but it's also for the watching world too. But first and foremost, it is a gift for the body of Christ. That's why we read in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10 these words. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good to all people, but especially those who belong to the household of believers. The gift of service is a practical ministry. It's a special ability to serve, to assist people in such a way that their lives are built up and they feel truly blessed. You know, when we think of this gift, and when we think we might have it, we know that we might have it because we just have a desire to help, to practically make a difference in people's lives, to bless them and to build them up. And when we're talking about this, with regards to the church, the Bible doesn't really specifically say what this gift of service is. But what is clear is this gift of service is practical. Whether it's washing up after a service, whether it's serving in the children's ministry, doing the jobs which are so vital for us as a church, but actually go unnoticed most of the time. Every act of service is an act of service to Jesus. Servers are faithful Servers are loyal. Servers do what they're called to do wholeheartedly. And then we see the gift of teaching in our passage together today. The word in Greek is the word didaskon, and it's the supernatural ability to communicate biblical truth to others in an understandable way. The word of God is proclaimed by the prophets, but it's explained by the teachers. It's the ability to explain, to root, and to ground people in the truth of God. The gift of teaching isn't just the ability to tell people what a text says, or even to provide a practical application to it, but it's the ability to connect people and keep people rooted in the Word of God. You know that you're a teacher when you explain the Word of God and people are connected to it. It's not just the gift which is used from the front here, but we need teachers in our children's ministries. We need them to be connected to the Word of God. We need teachers in our youth ministries to excite them about what the Bible says and how they can have a relationship with God. We need teachers in our life groups who are going to connect people there to the Word of God. We need teachers in every sphere of our church. It's what Jesus meant in Matthew 28 when he says teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Teachers connect people to the truth day in, day out. They help people stay rooted and grounded in what the Bible says. And then we see the gift of encouragement. Or some translations, as the translation I read out at the beginning says, exhortation. And what we're talking about here is the ability the supernatural ability to offer counsel that is comforting and challenging and is always consistent with the word and the character of God. It's the supernatural ability to excite, to motivate, and to comfort. It often accompanies the gift of evangelism because those who encourage have a heart to encourage people to find Christ for themselves. And then we see giving listed in our list here today. As Christians, we are all called to give. It is part of our worship. That's why we highlight it at a certain point in our service every single week. But there are some people who are blessed with a gift of being liberal in their generosity, who can give of their possessions, of their money, of their talents, of their time, of their food, and of their clothing. Some people, I believe, have been given the God-given ability 
to make money. Not so they can build up their empire, but rather they can use the money that they make in order to spread the gospel and help the poor and build up the church. I introduced you a few weeks ago, if you remember, in an old sermon series to one of my youth leaders when I was growing up. Now, this guy, he is an incredibly wealthy man. You wouldn't know it by looking at him. You wouldn't know it by the way that he lives. But from a business sense, this guy, everything he touches, literally everything he touches, turns to gold. Why? Because I believe it's because he's extremely generous with what he does with his finances. I know couples who haven't been able to afford a house, and he's sorted them out with a deposit. I know ministries that are happening right now that would not be happening if he had not been involved in them and helped them from a generous point of view. I don't believe in the prosperity gospel, that idea that the more you give, the the more you get. But I do believe that God gives certain individuals the ability to make money in order to advance the kingdom of God and use that money to build up his church and to release people from where they're at. Givers are generous, they're trusting. They don't exercise it with an ulterior motive, but they do it simply out of love to glorify God and to meet the needs of brothers and sisters throughout the world. And then there's a gift of leadership. This is the special ability to convince others to cooperate in harmony and unity to accomplish the goals of the kingdom. This isn't a political definition of leadership. It's not a civil definition of leadership. It's not even a governmental definition of leadership. But the gift of leadership here, as its first love, has Jesus at the center and his church. It's the willingness to influence for the purpose of bringing health to the body of Christ. The Greek word here used for leadership literally means the person who is standing at the front of the line. It's the person who says, I'll go first, I'll love first, I'll serve first, I'll minister first, I'll pray first. And finally, we see the gift of mercy here in our passage. That's the ability to respond to the hurts and the needs of others with empathy and compassion. It takes on many forms, working with the poor, working with the elderly, the disabled, those who are ill, those who are hurting through really tough life circumstances. And it says that those who serve in this capacity do it with cheerfulness. The word cheerfulness here is the word where we get our word hilarity from. It means that we do these things with gladness and graciousness. Friends, there are many spiritual gifts which are listed in Scripture. And today, I want you to know and you to understand that you are gifted. And when we think about spiritual gifts, it's easy to get bogged down and then not know how we're gifted, and not know what our purpose is, and not know what God wants to do through our lives. Or believe the lie which says you don't have a gifting, and you don't have a purpose. We could have looked at a whole bunch of spiritual gifts together today, some which many people in this congregation are gifted with. And in the course of life groups, I hope you do open those up and explore them together. But what I want to do today, and the reason I wanted to revisit this passage was that for the benefit of all of us, yes, but also for the benefit of some, particularly those who don't feel like they are gifted, and particularly those who don't really understand or know their purpose and what their giftings might be. Because there is a sense that whether what we've read together today are your primary giftings or not. There is a sense that as Christians, we are all called to operate in these in some way or another. So if prophecy is proclamation, this week, see where God might be calling you to urge someone to follow Christ's will. If serving builds up the body of Christ, look for opportunities this week where you can serve. If teaching is about connecting others with the Word of God, how can you connect those that you love this week to His Word and help them stay grounded in it? If encouragement is what God is calling us to do, how can you encourage others this week to walk closer with God? As Christians, we're all called to give, but how can you look for opportunities this week to be generous? If leading is going first, which areas of church life 
can you lead the way in this week? And how can you show mercy with cheerfulness to those who are in desperate need within our body this week? If by stepping out, God begins to reveal gifts in our life and show us what our gift mix might be. If by going for it, God opens up opportunities for us and shows us where we're called to go. My exhortation this week is simply this. Look for opportunities to step out and to step into what God might be calling you to and go for it. And just see what the Holy Spirit does. Just see what God does and the opportunities and the divine appointments that are opened up just by saying, all right, God, here I am. I'm available. I'm going to invite the band to come back up. And as we do every week, we want to respond to God's words, recognizing that this isn't just theory, but God wants us to put this stuff into practice. That God wants us to walk in our purpose and his will and his ways for our lives. So I'm going to invite you to stand again if you're able. And I'm going to invite our prayer team to come out to the front, uh, maybe over to this corner if that's okay. Because I want to give an opportunity this morning for people to receive some prayer ministry and maybe even some prophetic words over their life this morning where God might be calling you to serve, what mission God might be calling you into. And as we've spoken about this today, maybe you are here and you're like, I just don't know how God has gifted me and I just don't know what God is calling me to do. I want to encourage you this morning, as we sing again, just to come over to this corner and receive prayer from our ministry team that God might birth in you a holy excitement about where he's calling you to go and what he's calling you to do. But equally this morning, I recognize that you might be here and carrying a heavy load. And there might be things going on in your life which are kind of dominating your thoughts at the moment and it's hard to see anything else. You know, one of the best things you can do when you find yourself in those moments is to reach out to someone in prayer. And our prayer team would love to pray for you for anything this morning, whatever it is. But specifically, if you want to know and learn and walk in what God has for you, if you want God to reveal something in your life where he is calling you to serve, I want to encourage you to receive some prayer as we sing again this morning. Father God, I want to pray for each and every one of us today. I thank you, Lord God, that your word tells us that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. I thank you, Lord God, that you know the plans you have for each and every person in this room. You knew us before we were even born. And you have a purpose for our lives. And Holy Spirit, as we sing, as we receive some prayer this morning, as we worship, Lord, may you be revealing to people in this place what you're calling them to do and who you're calling them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.